Okay, welcome everyone to Circle's 19th Wild and Scenic Film Festival. My name is Ashley Oberhouse. I am Circle's River Policy Manager and I help manage Circle's Growing Green for the Yuba campaign. Um, for those that don't know, um, our Growing Green for the Yuba campaign um, is to help the community understand how regulation can be a tool that allows agriculture to align with objectives that maintain water quality and promote habitat for fish and wildlife. In partnership with important stakeholders, such as the ones on this workshop, we're hosting educational and on-farm workshops, promoting best management practices, and participating in additional collaborative leadership, science stewardship, and education. Today, we are hosting this workshop called Nevada County Cannabis in 2021, Where Are We Now? After California legalized personal and commercial cannabis cultivation through Prop 64 in 2017, Nevada County chose to be a leader in the Yuba River watershed by crafting and passing a local ordinance approved in 2019. Unfortunately, we still have less than 100 farmers legally growing cannabis um, out of an estimated 3,500. Then like most of the state, Nevada County and the watershed were impacted by 2020 events. These impact, impacts have highlighted the economic and social barriers to legalization. So we are graced today for this webinar to gather a group of panelists that cover a breadth of local cannabis perspectives. And this webinar will largely be an open panel discussion. But first, we're going to do a round of introductions. So again, if you're just joining us, my name's Ashley Overhouse. I'm with The Circle, the South Yuba River Citizens League. And we are hosting the 19th Wild and Scenic Film Festival. And this is the workshop titled Nevada County Cannabis in 2021. Where are we now? So I'll hand it off to our program manager, Alicia Wiseman, to introduce herself. Welcome everyone. My name is Alicia Wiseman. I am the River Science Project Manager here at the South Yuba River Citizens League. And I get to work on a variety of projects, including this Growing Green campaign with Ashley, um, which holds a special place in my heart. Um, I've had a history in the cannabis space. I own a local garden store called Heather Glen Hydro and I'm a co-owner of the Legion of Bloom. So it's really great to find myself here getting to moderate this panel with um, a group of diverse local experts. So um, with that, let's go ahead and introduce our panel. And let's start with Diana, if you can introduce yourself and then sort of peg someone when you're finished. Hi everyone, Diana Gamzon here. I'm the executive director of the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance. The Nevada County Cannabis Alliance is a local uh, trade association that represents the um, cannabis community in Nevada County. And we um, advocate for reasonable policy. We provide education to the community on um, all sorts of uh, cannabis regulations and business skills. Um, and then we also provide opportunities for our members to be connected to the greater um, statewide marketplace and to one another. So building a community is really important to us. And um, I'm so happy to be here. John, you're up next. Thanks, Diana. Uh, my name is John Foley. I own Yellow Dog Family Farms, which is a, a permitted cannabis farm here in Nevada County. Um, I hold a specialty cottage mixed light license, which is the smallest license type that the state offers. And so we are a true family run uh, business here. Um, we don't have employees. We're it's my wife and I and our two young children and, and we're, we're grinding it out as a family. Um, Personally, I also um, try to do a lot of advocacy work with, uh, with Diana and the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance, working with policymakers and, um, and advocating for, for reasonable uh, policy here in the county. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Craig. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, my name is Craig Griesbach. I'm the director of the Nevada County Building Code Compliance and Cannabis Compliance Departments um, here for the county organization. We are the basically the local regulatory program for the cannabis industry here in Nevada County. And we're heavily involved in some of the primary um, leads for cannabis policy here in Nevada County. With that, I'll hand it back over to you, Alicia. Thanks so much. And as Ashley mentioned at the beginning, and if there are people that are just joining us, um, the outline of this will be a panel discussion, which we have a few questions already set up to kick us off, but we would really appreciate your engagement. So we welcome plenty of questions um, throughout this. Um, please post them in the event of chat, 
But before we dive into panel questions, we are going to get a quick update from Craig on um, kind of where we're at now in Nevada County, um, what's new, what's changed, what's been challenging. All right, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, as Ashley mentioned, some of the topics I'm gonna mention here um, in the intro is, although the cannabis industry and culture has been strong in our community for decades and really been in our history for a long time, the local legal permitting program is very young, meaning that it's only been really a little over a year and a half since it's been set up and the local ordinance has been adopted. Local regulation followed behind state legalization um, with the adoption of the local cannabis ordinance in May of 2019. Leading up to the adoption of the local program, there were several years of work building up to that. Um, some of that work included completion of the community engagement process, which involved the community advisory group or CAG and several other um, processes leading up to that, that point. Completion of the local cannabis environmental impact report several cannabis ballot measures and establishment of a cannabis tax. Currently we have 143 commercial cannabis applicants and permittees in the local cannabis permitting program. There are over 3000 cannabis cultivation sites anticipated to exist in the county. So obviously we have uh, quite a bit of work ahead of us to get everybody into that legal program. In the coming years, we'll be looking to do pretty much everything we can to support the legal industry and really to bring it into normalcy here locally. Um, hopefully that'll help it thrive economically and we can embrace that culture in our community for decades to come. Some of the main focus areas we're gonna have moving forward are continuing to remove some barriers to entry into the legal program, uh, continue process improvement with our local program, taking uh, on enforcement of some of the illegal cultivation sites and some of the more egregious violators and adapting local regulation to support the cannabis industry. So that meaning um, looking at additional license types and adapting our local ordinance to meet the needs of that industry as that evolves at the state and also the federal level. So we really look forward to continue our work in collaboration with our local partners, many of them on this panel today um, really to move the industry forward in a positive direction. Um, we got a long ways to go, but we've made some great strides and looking forward to the, to the years to come. With that, I'll hand it back over to you, Alicia. Awesome. Thanks for those updates and thanks for all your hard work. We know it's not an easy feat. Um, okay, cool. So the first question we have is, how has your business and or farm fared in 2020? and uh, specific lessons learned that you would like to share. Um, and maybe we can start with John on this question. Sure, um, I mean, 2020, right? It's been a little bit of a wild ride. Um, it's been an interesting year for sure uh, between COVID and, and everything else that's gone on. But, you know, I have to say, despite all that, the farm fared well this year, um, you know, beginning of 2019, um, when COVID first hit, uh, cannabis was deemed an essential business. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, regulated cannabis sales actually increased during the pandemic. So the market stayed relatively strong. Um, you know, so by running extremely lean and mean and having um, a full year of operation without permitting hurdles to get through, uh, we actually turned a profit in 2020. Um, as far as important lessons learned and probably some really good startup advice for people that are coming in to the program is just keep things as simple and as low cost as possible starting up and just be willing to put in the hours yourself and grind it out and uh, crawl to profitability and then reinvest in your business as revenue allows and dictates. I think a lot of people get in trouble because they kind of try to build out their dream scenario from the beginning before they're even operational and they simply run out of money or, you know, or they're so far in debt that they never make their way back out. So, you know, slow and steady kind of wins this race, at least what, um, what I've been noticing. And, and um, you know, that's definitely what I would share uh, of kind of, you know, learning the hard way for sure. Yeah, we can feel free to chime in, um, Diana or Craig, if you have any insights on, on 2020 thus far. Sure, 
Sure, I'll share um, some of the stuff that we've been hearing from our members. Um, so with the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance, about over 90% of all permitted farmers are members of the Alliance. And so we get a lot of really robust and great feedback from the community um, um, as, as well as the people who are just entering uh, the, the um, space as well. And I think one of the biggest things that we've learned in the office and with our board over this past year is the importance of, of course, resiliency, but resiliency supported by community. And um, it's been it's been odd, you know, we've had over, we've been in existence for, I think this is our fifth year, and um, we've always had regular monthly meetings. And that's where farmers would meet one another, share, share resources, ask questions, just, you know, um, build, build alliances. And since we have not been able to meet face to face, um, the networking and the connection that we've been able to um, build through our online Zoom meetings or our online industry affairs calls, or even through our internal, we have an internal communication channel has been more important than ever. Um, the farmers that are just coming in in 2021, making sure that they feel connected to their mentors or buddies that have already been through the process, have already been permitted, um, that's been really important. So our buddy program um, has been really successful this year, which matches incoming farmers with those who have already been permitted. But yeah, just the importance of, of community and that we can learn from one another and knowing that the people who are going through this process, that they are not alone, that there are resources to support them, that there are there's a lot of help out there. and um, I think that's the biggest message for for this past year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting with the pandemic just in general, because it, we see development outside of cannabis and cannabis at the same time. And this is when it comes to the holistic view of development here locally. This is the busiest year historically we've had, even even considering their early to mid 2000s when they were having the housing boom and stuff. So um, really development from a construction construction perspective and also cannabis, we continue to get tons of people having questions and wanting to buy property from uh, questions from realtors to people that have active permits. So it's it's been really good. And like John said, it's it was deemed an essential service right in the beginning. So they they really never missed a beat um, and nothing really slowed them down outside of everything else that it, uh, is impacted by COVID. So I think we're in a good position here and it's been a good year in 2020. Yeah, that to me, that just strikes me like our, our theme of Wild and Scenic this year, resilient by nature. I mean, I think 2020, if anything, highlighted the need for a lot of people to come back to the land or, or be you know, at home more, and that's definitely served a community like ours well, where um, it's becoming more, you know, it's just becoming more appealing to people to be in a place with more open space and where they have the opportunity to um, produce their own herbs or food or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, I think it's a really, it's been a good lesson in that way. Um, moving on to our next question. What's the number one issue that you guys believe um, prevents cannabis farmers and business owners from entering the legal regime? And perhaps Diana, if you can start us off because I think you have a great insight here um, just with helping through the buddy system and to helping getting people into the legal regime, what the hurdles are. One of the, the biggest hurdles that we have found um, is that cannab cannabis as, as a whole in the state of California is not considered an agriculture crop and an agriculture commodity. And that has really translated down to a local level and some of the discrepancies that we find between how cannabis is regulated. And so we have a, a crop which you know, by common sense, it is agriculture, but yet it's not considered agriculture. And so we have um, cannabis is one of the most regulated industries in one of the most regulated states in arguably one of the more uh, regulated counties. And so it's as we start moving into what is going to be our path to resiliency, 
moving forward. I mean, we've got a lot of, of, of we've got a lot of stuff coming to our industry. Um, in 2023, Unlimited Canopy opens up, although there's loopholes and it's already happening in counties. Um, and how can, and then of course, with, you know, federal legalization probably happening soon, how can our farmers stay competitive? How can we afford to stay competitive? Um, and so it's really going to come down to upfront costs, costs of regulations. And we, when we have farmers that are new to the game and considering what this looks like, it really comes down to what, you know, what, what are the upfront costs to get my garden going? And then what are going to be the costs to keep it running? It's when we compare, when I talk to my traditional farmer friends that have, you know, that are serving at the farmer's market or um, growing for the farmer's market or CSAs and, and we compare, you know, some of the requirements, it's, it's vastly different. And I think that it, it really stems back from that cannabis is not considered an agriculture crop. And so that's something that it's a statewide issue that we'll be looking at um, at, um, at, at the statewide issue, but. I, I can kind of jump in on that as well. It's just um, cost is huge to really get something up and running. A lot of the initial costs and then to, to recoup those is really challenging, especially quickly. Um, I mean, we are in a very heavily regulated state uh, when it comes to environmental review, environmental impacts, things like that. And I, I, there are a lot of positives of that, but there also comes a lot of red tape at times. So cannabis being defined as something different than like an ag crop or something outside of that, which there are some distinct differences and impacts related to cannabis, but there are also a ton of similarities to other businesses, to other um, activities that happen on site. So, but just costs overall are huge. And that's the main thing I've been seeing, you know, the cost to put in a fire safe driveway to your um, processing building or just to pay architects and engineers to get design plans to get you legal or permit things on your site that maybe weren't legal before. It's just, it's, it's un unsurmountable at times. And I think that's by, by and large, the biggest barrier right now. Yeah, sure. And I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback right off of, of Craig and Diana. Um, yeah, I mean, it really just comes down to overregulation and, and it's, it's not just uh, cannabis, as Craig said, but but cannabis is at the forefront of regulation, uh, with it being such a new and kind of volatile industry. And you know what it does, um, it extends timelines. You know, it it makes everything more expensive than you think it's going to be starting up, and it increases your operating costs too. And um, you know with a seasonal business in a, in a brand new marketplace, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. If you're not extremely careful and have a very well thought out business plan, um, rushing into it is, is going to be very challenging for a lot of people. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, in general, only the most, the most well-funded operators are the ones that can make it into the legal marketplace uh, at all, um, just due to the cost and the time that it takes, you know, where cannabis farmers are used to planting every year at a certain time, and then all of a sudden, maybe having to sit out a year or even possibly two years is devastating to people. And, you know, I don't know many people that can just not work for a year or two and be fine while starting up a business, but uh, that's the situation that a lot of people are facing and it's challenging. And I want to add on to that, what, what John just said, because it's important, is that other businesses may have, act, we, cannabis businesses don't have access to traditional capital. And so truly missing a season, it's, it, I mean, it could, it could be the end of the business. And so um, often these businesses are bootstrapping it from the beginning or trying to borrow from close friends or family. And so being able to, for a seasonal business, be operational as soon as possible is is key. Um, it's much different than starting um, a restaurant or another business where you're you're planning for those 
you know, you, you have um, traditional capital to help support you through that development phase. Cannabis businesses don't have that. And so um, there's there's a lot of complexities there. Um, and and it's true that while we have 100 and close to 150 that are either have their permit or in process, there's a lot of people that are watching the process to make sure that when they do enter, it's, you know, they're entering something that they're well educated on, that they've taken the time and built their business plan, um, and that they're they're entering a streamlined system. And so I think that we're gonna continue to see people um, coming in every year. And, and as, as we can show a successful um, industry, it will encourage even more people in. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and go ahead, Craig. Sorry, Alicia. No, please. <laughs> I was just going to piggyback on the, the banking side of it is it trickles all the way down to even us, you know, we're our tax collector has to figure out how they're even going to be able to handle all this cash that they normally don't have to deal with. And, you know, an example of real impacts, when we had the Jones fire this last year, a couple of our permitted farmers had damage to their crops, but they didn't have access to traditional insurance, like crop insurance and things like that. So they just kind of eat it. In a lot of ways, to me, if somebody is going through the regulatory process and they have a local and state license, they should have sa the same access to funding sources and sort of safety nets that others do. And that's just a a lot of that comes from the federal side of it, but it's a, a huge issue. Yeah, we're certainly waiting on those industries to catch up, right? Industry and funding. I can't just go into Wells Fargo and get a traditional loan, as you mentioned. Um, and yeah, I mean, agriculture is one of those things where you, you already have to withstand so many potential blows, like a really bad storm in September where you could lose your crop to mold or a fire where your entire crop can burn down. And so um, to then also miss a full season, you know, there's, there's definitely just regular agricultural hurdles and then hurdles of it being a new industry, which are unique to cannabis. So thanks for highlighting those. Um, but hopefully it will get easier as, as hopefully federal regulations catch on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, Circle's a watershed organization, and we are curious what you guys consider, um, or whether you guys consider watershed-friendly cannabis to be a priority, and what are some tools that you foresee being useful to promote watershed-friendly cannabis or the use of best management practices um, to ensure water quality in our region? I'm happy to kick this off. Um, so environmental sustainability is, is the founding principle of the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance. And so um, that's translated into many, many different ways. But um, currently, we have a monthly regenerative farming um, uh, workshop that we do. We just had it uh, had one on Wednesday with Catalyst, Catalyst Bio Amendments. We talked about building soil. And so um, we know that our value for our industry is in our craft farming um, and in our environmental, um, you know, growing the best quality cannabis. And so um, I think that it, that ethos fits into the values of what has brought so many of us to Nevada County. Um, and, and it comes through the, the farming that happens. And as a Nevada County Cannabis Alliance as a vehicle for education, we try to make sure that we're bringing those opportunities to the industry, as well as partnering each year with Circle on Growing Green for the Yuba, which has just been such an exceptional program. And we're so grateful that that's uh, continuing. Thanks, John, do you have something to add? Yeah. Sure, uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say it's, of course, um, you know, watershed friendly cannabis is extremely important. And I think fortunately, you know, the majority of farmers in Nevada County, and, it, and it's probably different than a lot of other places elsewhere in the state, are really, you know, community conscious people. And, you know, not only do they care about preserving, you know, the ethos of our community, but also protecting our environment because we live in such a beautiful, amazing place. And I don't think anyone wants to see it degraded. Um, and I think the majority, probably the vast majority of farmers already um, are already farming with 
pretty strict organic practices. And like Diana said, um, many are, are really uh, striving towards that regenerative agriculture method and model. And I think, um, <clears throat> again, like I think we're gonna continue to see more and more of that as small farmers, you know, even if we um, are allowed to expand here within the county, we're still gonna be small compared to what's going on in the rest of the state. And so not only is kind of that regenerative model good for the environment, but it helps a small farm kind of stand out and provide a unique product to market that's not being produced in, you know, the Salinas Valley or something like that. Um, I think that culture is already here in Nevada County, and I think it's going to continue to grow to really be stewards of the land and, and regenerate the land as well. As Diana and John kind of mentioned, it, I mean, we have a very sustainably minded culture here in Nevada County, even outside of cannabis. I think that's, that's embedded in the community here. And a lot of our farmers we have that are through the permitted process, they're going above and beyond what the minimum standards are. They're, they're already thinking, they're already asking questions. They're trying to do what's right to their property and their land. And a lot of these people, they, they live there. So and they're raising their families there. So they, they want to do the right thing. And if, if you see these, some of these permitted farms, they are beautiful. I mean, they're a shining example of how somebody should treat the environment, how they should think sustainably as compared to uh, the illegal grows we go out on and partner with you know, fish and wildlife where they're diverting streams, they're damaging uh, endangered species. And it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring these properties back to where they were. So it just sort of kudos to the permitted farmers and the permitting process is that it really does work from an environmental perspective. And there's two things that are happening this upcoming year that we're really excited about. Um, one is the Appalachians program, um, which is sort of like wine standards, but for for cannabis, um, building upon the terroir of the air of um, where the cannabis is being grown. And then the other one is the Cal Organics program, which is the organic standard for cannabis. And so these are still in the rulemaking phase right now. Um, we'll be getting the final regs probably within the next month or so, but that's an area that we'll be bringing a tremendous amount of education to the greater community as well as the, the cannabis farmers. And Yeah, and those, those will help, I think, highlight what John mentioned about um, allowing, you know, enabling um, Nevada County to be able to distinguish itself as sort of this small cottage farmer that um, does steward the land in a way that's different from these, say, you know, five acre canopy, you know, where it's a little harder to keep track of your impacts to the land, um, just based on size and fragmentation. Um, okay, great. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about policy now. Um, at the end of December, California announced in its revised budget that they will move forward with consolidating all state regulatory agencies into a Bureau of Cannabis Control, something that was initially delayed in 2020. This consolidation will happen by this summer. Do you think that will make it easier or harder for the Nevada County cannabis community? And maybe Craig, you can kick us off since you have a unique um, position here. Um, I guess I'm a little bit of a skeptic when it comes to the state process, just because I, staff and I have a lot of experience working with the state regarding trying to get information, trying to figure out their state permitting process um, and really getting things done. And there's a lot of challenges. I would say the number one challenge is the sort of handcuffs we have here locally from a regulatory perspective um, are come from the state. So I think long-term them consolidating is a good thing and it should streamline that process if it's done right. I think there will be a lot of short-term pain to get there just because a lot of times historically when I've seen that happen, there's, it's kind of a cluster when they're combining departments, resources, staff, and things like that. But long-term, I think it'll be a great thing. Um, hopefully it's just not too much pain to our local farmers and us and the immediate process. And I would say, um, you know, I probably 
like Craig, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, while I can certainly see there's a benefit to having one regulating body kind of encompassing the whole cannabis industry rather than three, um, the thing that kind of freaks me out about it is the fact that that cannabis is now not, or cannabis cultivation is not going to be regulated by the CDFA, the Department of Food and Agriculture, which is the department that traditionally regulates regular agriculture. And so I feel like it's kind of one step, it's, it's kind of removing cannabis one step further from um, that agricultural designation. And so I think it's probably more of a benefit and kind of promotes more of industrial style operations rather than what we're trying to create here in, in Nevada County. Um, and, it, and, you know, it's confusing because kind of like how Diana mentioned before um, with the Appalachians program uh, coming up and, and the OCAL organic certification program coming up, those are still going to be regulated by the CDFA. So we have, again, we have this overly complicated regulation that, you know, <laughs> you just kind of have to shake your head out and wonder what they're thinking. But um, again, this is, a, this is a business of adaptability and, and we'll roll with the punches and, and, and make the best of the situation, I suppose. Yeah, I'll piggyback off of that and say, we just don't know how it's gonna affect our farmers here in Nevada County yet. The language hasn't come out yet. Um, and so it's just, it, it, it's unclear. I think that exactly as John mentioned, um, the farming community uh, definitely has concerns that we will be, we will be out, out of CDFA. Um, and how can, we, how can we ensure that as we wanna be uh, designated close, not even closer, as agriculture, um, it seems like we're getting a little bit further from that. And so um, I'm really grateful that um, our organization has partnered with a statewide organization called Origins Council. And it is an association that specifically represents um, legacy cannabis producing regions. And so we have secured a lobbyist. Um, and so we'll be engaging on this consolidation matter through a lobbyist and, and on behalf of the members of the Cannabis Alliance and the cannabis community here, but also really building coalition with our other legacy cannabis producing regions. So Mendo, Humboldt, Big Sur, Santa Cruz, um, Sonoma, Trinity, um, how can we in coalition advocate for, again, consistency with agriculture and make sure that we are um, staying on the forefront of this consolidation issue and seeing how it affects us here. Yeah, that's a great point um, that coming together amongst different communities is gonna be a powerful tool um, to have a seat at the table. Um, so we do have a couple comments here. Um, one comment from Minkin Nelson um, said, thanks for bringing up the ability to stay competitive, Diana. Um, as it goes federal, we are potentially closing California out of the market and Nevada County only allows for two of the smallest tiers. If our community is investing in this industry, we should be thinking long term. Um, and yeah, I think that's, you know, a great comment and something to consider, you know, if at some point in the next five years, cannabis does become kind of an interstate commodity and we're being compared to you know, other states that, you know, are maybe even growing indoor and might have a bigger carbon footprint, um, but it's still cheaper to produce indoor than outdoor just based on regulations. I mean, that sounds crazy, but it's, I mean, it's actually already happening, I think a little bit. Um, so yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, and someone had asked more about barriers. Um, so potentially, if uh, maybe Craig, if you can elaborate on some of the significant permitting hoops um, that people have to jump through as well. And maybe John, you might know firsthand from experience, so feel free to chime in. So, I mean, all the, most of the barriers that I've seen are related to it being such a new commercial, quote unquote commercial activity. I mean, a lot of these sites has been in operation for decades, 
and, and a lot of them. So in starting from scratch and trying to legally permit houses, barns, processing building, grading, roadways, and some of these are way out in the middle of nowhere. So just that in and of itself is to try to get their properties completely legal in general, even outside of cannabis is a huge barrier. We thought about that a little bit. You know, we have a transitional period that helps um, them come into compliance by being able to still operate. And there's some other things in there for assistance, but it's, uh, that's challenging. Um, we have a rural county, all rural counties, it's a little bit like the wild west, you know, when you get out in some of these parts. So getting them into compliance first to even qualify for a commercial cannabis permit is a, is a huge barrier. And I don't really know how we, how we get around that other than trying to be flexible and come up with different solutions. One thing that I'm excited about that we'll be working on this next year is um, there's grant funding available from the state related to cannabis equity. So it's really related to decriminalization and to assess people to into the legal market. So we'll be working on that and creating an assessment and a program for us moving forward to hopefully where we can provide funds to people to help with some of those barriers, which is huge. I mean, there's potentially millions of dollars in funding at the state level that we could qualify for. And I think that could be a, a massive help and be really the difference maker for people becoming legal or not. Yeah, and I would say, you know, Craig definitely touched on it. You know, part of the problem is, is <clears throat> each of these projects is so site specific and they all have their own individual uh, problems and challenges getting permitted. And, and I mean, it really goes back to, you know, if you're thinking about traditional farming, right? You don't want a property that's easily accessible. You know, you wanted a property that was back in the woods, that was private, that no one's going to bother you. Um, and now, we want the exact opposite, right? I mean, we now we're trying to build a commercial business on these properties. And with that commercial designation, there's certain standards that have to be met. And, you know, that's that's not just from the county, that's from the state and from, from uh, federal regulated agencies as well. So it becomes extremely challenging. And so, I, you know, like Craig said, I don't know exactly how that, how that changes other than where there is wiggle room, we should be siding on the air of, of making people compliant rather than not. And I, I still feel like we get tripped up a little bit by getting, you know, too in the weeds a little bit um, on certain situations. And, and, and I understand due diligence has to be done, but you know, where there is wiggle room and where we can make it work, we should try to, you know, giving, kind of this unique situation of industry. So hopefully we can keep moving forward with that and, and getting more people into the system. I think one of where the barrier or what, what we experienced in 2020 is this was a new process and just just yeah being an iterative process what we what we what at least I learned was that this intersection of cannabis not being not being considered an agriculture crop being considered more commercial meeting yet the fact that it is agriculture and what those regs look like at a local level. And really, um, I'm really grateful for the work we've done with um, county staff to work through some of these issues. And um, and of course, for the cannabis community for, for um, being engaged in the process as well. But I think that that's, that's where we can continue to, uh, my careers is that, that intersection, that funky intersection, commercial and ag. Yeah, and I think one example, like there's been some of the details worked out with the bathroom requirements recently, and um, I know it's tough, you know, for many people to have a um, commercial style drying room that meets, you know, standards that weren't in place before, and, you know, it's hard to put that up overnight when you need to pull a grading permit or build a new structure, and you know, without a drying room, there's not much you can do. Um, it's pretty important. Um, and someone else brought up that the driveway standards versus roadway standards for these rural locations is a huge hurdle. So um, yeah, we'll keep 
continuing to work together and and um, help kind of alleviate these hurdles by just continuing these conversations. Uh, so someone actually has a question for me. So um, <laughs> I'd love to hear as a river scientist um, and being in the cannabis industry, where you love to see those two worlds intersect and collaborate most. Um, so thanks for that question. So one of the biggest opportunities that we feel um, at the South Hebrew River Citizens League is um, how we can use science to help distinguish those um, cottage style cannabis farmers that are using best management practices, how we can come up with scientific methods to distinguish those type of players from people who are, you know, not really being thought for, thoughtful or intentional at all in their cultivation practices. So um, our Growing Green program and some of our next steps um, working with the Alliance um, is we hope to we hope to find a farm or two where we can work together to take water samples and um, essentially just be able to provide some information for what sort of like low impacts um, are happening on properties where people are taking good care. So people that are using cover crops, um, people that are set back appropriately from water, um, people that are using a well in lieu of, you know, obviously you can't just draw from a surface water source. Um, and we've got to be able to have these numbers um, to really show, we think it leverages um, getting more people into the legal space. And we think that by providing this information, we are going to be able to show how um, how useful it is for our watershed to get as many people into the legal regime as possible because, um, you know, when you're just grading roads with no thought, you know, erosion is, is a big thing. And um, we really think that there are many people out there that are growing in a way that are having um, not, not nearly as big of impacts as some of the other players out there. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add on that. I'll just say I'm so grateful that um, that this program exists and that moving forward, these are some of the goals for Growing Green, because again, it makes our, our unique area in Nevada County so unique um, that we can work together um, and, and have um, a lot of our best practices be based on science. science. And so um, thank you. Yeah, and I would, just, I would just echo that. I mean, it's a testament to the area we live in, right? That that um, that this is an important thing that people are willing to collaborate on this and and come up with scientific data that supports it. And and I don't think you're going to have an issue finding a couple farms um, to work with, you know, collecting that data. So, it, you know, it's a testament to the area that we live in, and it's and it's definitely unique. Uh, to California, the you know the California cannabis marketplace in general, because certainly not everyone is is thinking that way. Yeah, totally. And and at the end of the day, sometimes it can improve even efficiency and costs, right? Like if you focus on your soil microbiome, like you're going to increase the efficiency of your nutrient uptake, right? And that's going to prevent you from using excess nutrients. Um, so it's, it's definitely a win-win. Um, and so, yeah, you can always contact us here at Circle if you are a farmer and you're interested in um, helping out with this program. We're all ears and looking for that partnership to kick off fairly soon. Um, we have another comment from Jared Steinman. Um, we need more retail licenses, as in delivery retail non-storefront licenses made available to small businesses seems like, well, I don't think the end quite quite makes sense, but um, okay, it looks like that was the end of the question in quotation marks. So I do believe there's one other license coming on the horizon for Grass Valley for a brick and mortar, but tell us where we're at. Is that something you would know about, Craig, if there's um, any opportunity for delivery retail? 
So right now, um, Grass Valley has several different license types they're considering, and they're actually working on building their program now. I just talked to them last week a little bit about it. Um, and I think Diana is involved in that conversation as well. Um, as far as in the county, we're actually going to be talking to the Board of Supervisors next week at their workshop to discuss kind of the the status of cannabis regulation here locally and next steps, what they um, think we should be working on related to, should we look into additional license types? And if so, what type? We've received a ton of feedback this last year um, through workshops and listening sessions that have identified a few areas that there is a need um, for maybe different license types. So more to come, but it's still a little bit unknown in the county and the unincorporated areas anyway. Diana, is that something that the Alliance, um, do you guys have people that are interested in types of licenses like that as well, or is it mostly just cultivation? No, we, I mean, we advocate and work with our members to represent their needs on all license types. And so uh, Grass Valley is coming online with additional delivery. I think in Nevada City, we definitely have opportunities for more retail as well. Um, and then in, in, in the county, the, the biggest thing that we've heard from the members for the need for the county is for what's called a micro business license. And what that does is it allows farmers to, um, small farmers um, to vertically integrate within their own premise. Um, so it might be that a farmer on their own premise can create um, a, a um, a salve or or um, or a bath salt or whatever it might be, but these it really um, creates a more economically efficient way for some farmers to uh, get products to market. And so um, that's that's one of the biggest areas of feedback that we have heard directly from the farmers as a need in the county. Um, and then it also sets us up long term for when we start moving in the direction of cannabis tourism. Um, this sets us up for models such as a winery type model. And so this really is, it, as it relates to the county, some of the direction that we're going in. And um, of course, adding more retail opportunities um, is going to be key. One of the biggest areas for key is going to be for events. And events is where we've heard that our small businesses are really, uh, is really important to them so that they can have direct to consumer experiences and direct to consumer sales. And so we are also um, looking to move those forward in the various jurisdictions. And I, just, to, just to follow up on that, I think one of the comments was how do we stay relevant, you know, when the federal marketplace opens up and this is exactly it, you know, as small farms, having access to events, having access to micro businesses licenses where they can start to kind of emulate a winery model and, and tap into the tourism market um, is exactly how you do those types of things. So it's gonna take changes and regulations and obviously it's gonna take a whole process within the county to come up with ways of how that works well, but um, we have to start thinking creatively a little bit outside the box of, of how we create a sustainable industry here in Nevada County for decades to come. Um, the last thing I think anyone wants to see is kind of a cannabis ghost town in a few years if, when everyone goes out of business. So we have to be forward thinking. And I think we have the support from the county. And, and of course, we're going to keep pushing hard from the advocacy side to, uh, to make those things happen. Yeah, those little markets are a really powerful tool. I know they've used them, I want to say Santa Barbara. Um, but yeah, especially for smaller cannabis brands to be able to distinguish themselves and yeah, connect with the end user. I know for the Legion of Bloom, um, before COVID, we would often have like table and dispensaries, just letting people know like what's different about our brand, like solventless, like less chemicals, plastic free packaging. Those types of things are hard to relate to people unless you have a presence. And um, yeah, I remember um, people talking about wanting to have an event at the fairgrounds at some point, um, I wanna say over a year ago and it, there wasn't a legal pathway yet, but I think that could be a really great creative way. Um, and tourism 100%, I mean, that's how we're gonna keep the cottage culture alive and farm visits and, um, 
yeah, there's a lot of a lot of opportunity there. Okay, so I have no questions at the moment from um, any webinar watchers. So feel free to chime in. We've got a little bit of time left. I do have one more question. Um, just any final words of wisdom about the future and um, you know success in the cannabis industry in Nevada County? And maybe we'll start with Diana. Sure, um, I would say, stay engaged, tap in, tap into the community. Um, for those that are in the industry, those are that are considering uh, being in industry or those that are supporting the industry. We, we have um, really built a well-connected community here um, and there's a ton of information to share, but, but on top of all that, policy is changing every day, every week. And so by, by being part of a community, you get firsthand knowledge of what's going on so that you and your business or those that you represent can stay competitive. But also it helps to give yourself a voice as things are shifting, both at the state level, but here locally. And that's what's gonna make our, 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 um, our industry here unique is really that we are stronger together and that what we're doing is unique and that when farmers or consumers in the marketplace, whether it's California right now, or it's gonna be North Carolina, when things open up or wherever it might be, that they know where they're getting their, they know their farmer, they know their producer, they know who they're getting this from, or they, they at least feel like they do. And so it all starts with uh, staying staying connected and, and really start, uh, being part of what's building this community here. Um, I would just say, you know, you know, cannabis is here to stay, right? I mean, it's not going anywhere, you know, and this is just the beginning of it. The majority of people want legal access to it. And that's not just in California, that's nationwide. Um, every election cycle proves that more and more, you know, with more and more states coming online every single, every single time. And, you know, it's time to embrace it as a real and viable industry. And for, for our policymakers, it's time to promote it and encourage it, um, especially in a time of economic downturn, right, with, with COVID happening. And so for me, it's really simple. You know, since it's all regulated at a local level, um, the jurisdictions that embrace cannabis and make it business friendly are going to win. And the ones that don't are going to lose. I mean, it's really that simple. And so, you know, we're going to keep fighting the good fight to make sure that we have sound and reasonable policy here in the county, that Nevada County can create a sustainable future in the cannabis industry, in the statewide and national and international, whatever it turns into, marketplace, that, that we have a presence there. And, um, you know, it, it's encouraging to hear Craig at the beginning saying that, that that's their focus too. And, um, and I, I believe that. I can tell that just by the interactions we have on a, on a daily basis communicating. And so, you know, it's going to be a process, but at the same time, it's a fun process and it's something I enjoy and, and, uh, and it's important to make it work. So, you know, I'm all for it. You know, hopefully everyone can get on board and we, and we really help keep the ball moving forward and make sure Nevada County is, is here to stay because there's not many other economic drivers in the county. We need it. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, anything we can do to bring the industry more into normalcy. Um, a lot has happened in the last few years and the last real five years in a lot of ways that it's came a long way that I didn't even think it was gonna happen that fast, you know, as far as from a policy perspective. I mean, I was born and raised in the Emerald Triangle in Humboldt County, and I was essentially raised in the cannabis community. So it's kind of funny to me that I'm kind of on the regulatory side now. <laughs> Um, that it really is with our county team here, we are the biggest champions of this industry, even though we are the regulators um, of it in a lot of ways. But I believe in a long time, it should be a legally regulated industry. And it, we just need to keep on pushing that, supporting it, um, as well as holding people accountable, you know, that, that aren't doing the right thing. Um, 
but anything we can do and just really for our county team, the best ideas we've ever had for our program and policy is it's came from outside the county organization. It's came from the community. So reach out, you know, that's we're really accessible from email, phone calls. Um, we're in the community. We're doing workshops very often. Reach out um, and talk to us because some of the best ideas have, have came from the community, not us. So we just want to keep that rolling. Wonderful. Thanks. Those are all really great words of wisdom. <laughs> um, we have we do have one more question here, and it's specifically for the county. Um, it says, has the county considered reducing the property setbacks? Um, and I think you guys also have a meeting Monday. Is that right? So please feel free to share any details on that. So we have, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are uh, meeting with the board of supervisors next week at their annual board workshop to talk about priorities and touch base on the cannabis priority from 2020. There really hasn't been any discussions about reducing setbacks. That is from a high level of view, it sounds pretty simple to talk about. It really isn't. It's a very in-depth conversation that ties directly to our environmental impact report that would have to be revised to policy, to community feedback. It's, it's a huge discussion. And that hasn't something been something that's been really brought up on the forefront of our priorities right now. Not saying it won't in the future, but it just isn't right now. So that's a CEQA issue basically, the EIR? Yeah, it's directly tied into our environmental review and California Environmental Quality Act, which mm -hmm. everything is based on. So if that were to change, that would have to be evaluated. Good to know. Sorry, Diana, go ahead. No, it's all good. Um, I did want to say that um, there are, you know, depending on what the need is for a setback reduction, there is a tool um, to get a variance. And so that might be something that one may want to look into um, and I'm sure you can follow up with the county to get some more information on what what that looks like. Um, as for the meeting on Monday, um, we've been host, the Cannabis Alliance has been hosting monthly or twice a month support groups and so we do have a support group on Monday for farmers that are um, in the permitting process or considering the permitting process. We do these following our Get Legit workshops and um, that's Monday at three o'clock. And if you have any questions about that, you can email info, I-N-F-O, info, <laughs> at nccannabisalliance.org. Um, and uh, we can get back to you on Monday uh, and, and give you some information about that. Um, and I think we're just, uh, the, the last series of the Get Legit workshop is in, in February, and that's on the state licensing requirements. Um, and we are telling people to get their applications in now for uh, to if, if people are expecting to grow for next year. All right, June 1st, right around the corner. <laughs> Gotta keep it in mind. Um, all right, well, with that, we are running out of time. Um, we just wanted to thank everyone for coming today, everyone who was able to watch the webinar. We wanted to thank our panel um, for joining us and thank the Wild and Scenic Film Fest team um, for promoting this event. Um, so thank you guys for coming. And yeah, if you're interested in Growing Green or the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance um, or just hearing from the county, I think everyone's pretty accessible um, virtually by email right now. And we're really lucky to be in such a special community. So, you know, one day we'll all be able to share space um, soon enough. And um, I know we're looking forward to it. We're looking, at, looking forward to working further with um, the Cannabis Alliance and the county to help put on these events um, in person. So um, thanks again.